Here's the front page headline of the Nogales International newspaper from Friday. County cuts service. 879 streetlights to turn off. To save $90,000, cash-strapped Santa Cruz County in Arizona has decided to turn out the lights to let 879 streetlights go dark. Times are tough right now, like they are everywhere in the country, and this is Santa Cruz County's efforts to effort to tighten its fiscal belt. They are shutting off the lights. And you know, it's not just Nogales, Arizona, that is experiencing darker than normal nights right now. Last year, the city of Santa Rosa, California, decided to do the same thing. They removed 6,000 streetlights and turned off another 3,000 more after midnight, an effort to save the city 400 grand. Earlier this year, officials in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, shut off more than 3,000 of their streetlights. Colorado Springs, Colorado, turned off about 8,000 of theirs. Colorado Springs has also dropped more than 40 of its police officers. And I kid you not, they have auctioned off their police helicopters. Not because crime is over, wahoo, in Colorado Springs. Um, it's because they're broke. Philadelphia has decided to shut down three fire companies every day and three every night, rolling firefighting brownouts in order to try to save Philadelphia some cash. The Wall Street Journal reported recently on the growing number of places across the country where local governments are unpaving the roads. They are turning paved roads into gravel roads because paved roads are too expensive to maintain. It's not one little town's wacky Luddite solution. It's happening in North Dakota, more than 100 miles of road in South Dakota, in 38 counties in Michigan, and it's happening in Ohio, and it's happening in Alabama, and it's happening in Pennsylvania. Which means that somewhere in China, it is entirely possible that a business person sat down for a ride on a 200 mile an hour state of the art levitating bullet train and cracked open the Wall Street Journal and read about how in America, we've decided we can't afford paved roads anymore. Consider also Clayton County, Georgia. Clayton County, Georgia decided to solve its budget crisis by ending its public bus service. Not cutting back the number of buses, not suspending certain bus routes, but just shutting down its bus service altogether. More than 8,000 people who rely on that bus service every single day to get to work or school, they are totally out of luck. Speaking of school, that is where the state of Hawaii has decided to look to for an answer to its budget woes. Public schools in Hawaii have been implementing a four-day school week, just not opening schools on Fridays. Hawaii schools closed their doors on 17 Fridays over the past school year. Just make do, moms and dads. How are you going to deal with the child care issue? Hawaii, of course, is the home state of President Obama, who made the case today that shortchanging education, doing things like, say, cutting down the number of school days, um, is actually counterproductive to keeping the U.S. economy going. The single most important thing we can do is to make sure we've got a world-class education system for everybody. That is a prerequisite for prosperity. Education is an economic issue. Education is the economic issue of our time. If that's the case, if education is the economic issue of our times, then how exactly is our economy affected by just lopping a whole day of instruction off the school week. How exactly is our economy affected by 46,000 education jobs being lost over the past three months? In order to prevent more of that, in order to prevent things like cops and firefighters being laid off and streetlights being shut off, something extraordinary is happening in politics this week. Members of the House of Representatives are returning to Washington during their August recess to vote on emergency funding for states and local governments. A $26 billion state aid bill that will, among other things, prevent thousands of teachers from being laid off which is, if you ask Tea Party activists, it's a horrible idea to try to stop teachers from being laid off. Tea Party activists have reportedly planned protests against the aid package in at least a dozen states. The Hill newspaper says, quote, the activists are upset over $10 billion in the package for a fund to stop teacher layoffs. They argue that states have hired far too many teachers in the last decade, and they should be downsizing the pool of teachers rather than asking for a federal bailout. Oh, see, it's a bailout now. That's the argument. Class sizes are too small. We need to fire some more teachers, America. 
Apparently agreeing with the Tea Partiers are House Republicans, the vast majority of whom are expected to vote against that state aid bill tomorrow. Earlier today, soon-to-be former Republican Congressman Pete Hoekstra of Michigan tweeted this, quote, On the way to D.C., vote on more deficit-slash-stimulus spending. Spending is destroying America. Time to stop. I'll vote no. The number three House Republican, Mike Pence, stated his opposition to the bill this way. I have to tell you, I think the American people are tired of more spending, more bailouts, and I think they're going to be frustrated with Congress coming back from a recess when we should be listening to the American people to do more of the same. For the record, Mike Pence, along with a number of other Republicans, are now railing against this state aid bill for teachers and cops and firefighters while simultaneously arguing to extend the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. Against the state aid bill, which, by the way, is totally paid for and wouldn't be added to the deficit, they're, they're against that. But they are for tax cuts, which are not paid for, and which would add about mm, roughly uh, $700 billion to the deficit. Republicans are essentially arguing that rich people can't go back to the tax rates they were paying during the Clinton years in order to prevent rich people from having to go back to those tax rates, in order to prevent that horror movie. We're all going to have to take a kick in the teeth. We're going to have to just load $700 billion onto the deficit. Sure, it'll hurt. It's awful. But do it for the rich people. They hurt so bad in the 90s, we can never ask them to go back to that. Now, as for you people who have kids in public schools, you folks are going to have to suffer. We are cutting teachers. We are cutting cops. We're cutting firefighters. We're cutting streetlights. We're cutting buses. We are literally unpaving the roads for you because spending for you is wrong and it's bad for America. Spending for the richest people in the country to have a giant $700 billion tax cut? That's right. That's good for America. It's a hell of a choice heading into the fall. Joining us now is Ezra Klein, staff writer for The Washington Post and MSNBC contributor. Ezra, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, Rachel. How important is this bill? Uh, it's something you'll be used to hearing about Congress. It's an important bill, but it doesn't go far enough. This bill was originally wrapped in a much larger bill that the House passed out. I believe that bill's around $200 billion. Not every penny was state aid, but a lot more of it was. And so we are going to get into some of the things that are politically defensible here, popular here. Teachers is a big one, obviously. And then Medicaid funding, because governors in different states have just been screaming for it. They need help with Medicaid. But there's a lot of other things, as you noted, that won't get funded here. And it's because they've not been able to pick up the votes for it. This bill has gotten whittled down and as you would expect from that, these state budgets are going to get whittled down and so are state job rolls. Well, the argument against this state aid bill, the reason they're having to do it with this crazy last minute ju uh, jump back into session uh, thing that they're having to do now is because Republicans resisted it by saying, listen, the economy is really bad, so therefore we can't spend money on things like this. What would be the economic effect of spending a lot of money in the states right now. People would be people would remain employed. We tend to talk about this in two ways, right? One is the macroeconomic effect. You keep people employed, they don't go on to the unemployed roles, they're able to spend money in their towns, in their communities. That means they can go to the grocery store, the grocery store doesn't have to lay, lay people off, and on and on and on and on and on. This is not some sort of weird economic theory. If you fire a teacher, they don't have a job, they're unemployed. There's no disagreement about that among anyone. On the other hand, too, we don't, and we don't, I think, talk about this enough, so I was happy to hear it in your intro. There are actual services is that we will lose here. We will lose teachers, which means kids will have larger classes. We will lose firefighters and policemen. You will call 911 and the line will be busy. You will lose streetlights. You will lose infrastructure. This is not good long run. I mean, the real dangerous thing in, one of the, in a recession like this, or in a downturn like this, we're not in a recession anymore, is that you will destroy long-term growth at the cost of short-term. So you are going to, for short-term politics, reduce the deficit. And in doing, you will cut down the things we need in the long term, like the University of California system or like your roads. In, in, in the arguing over this, the other thing that's happening is sort of federal versus state. You've got people like Mitch Daniels and others out there saying, listen, the states are to blame 
for their budget problems. And any states that are doing okay are effectively being called on to subsidize states that were irresponsible. Republican Congressman Mike Pence is derisively referring to this bill as a state bailout bill. How do you feel about that accusation? It's really baffling. Before the crisis hit, the states had what are, had record rainy day funds. So a rainy day fund, they put away surplus money to be there for them if they need it in a recession. It was at an absolute record level. We'd never had rainy day funds that large in American history. But then, of course, we didn't just have a recession. We had the largest recession since the Great Depression. And it wasn't because Indiana or Nevada or any of these other states did a bad job regulating Wall Street or regulating global capital flows. This was a global economic crash. And so the rainy day funds weren't enough. The idea that, in fact, what we saw is that all 50 states in the union simply were horribly economically mismanaged all at once simply doesn't pass the laugh test. And now this sort of beggar thy neighbor uh, politicking you have from some of these governors who have an eye on 2012 is really going to be a problem. I mean, Indiana took those stimulus funds. It needed those funds. It's doing a bit better than some of its neighbors. And so now that Indiana is a little bit out of the hole, it's going to turn and say, ha ha, Nevada, this one's all your fault. This is not a good way to handle it because at the end of the day, we're still a country here. And if we as a country are not a good place to invest because our schools are terrible, because our roads are crap, you know, that money's going to go. It's going to go to China. It's going to go to Europe. It's going to go to places that have figured something else out. Well, actually, maybe not Europe at the moment. They're not doing very well either. Well, any place that actually has schools, say, five days a week right. um, or roads that are going to be more paved and led than less paved uh, has one up on us at this point, which is absolutely amazing. Ezra Klein, staff writer for The Washington Post and MSNBC contributor, thanks for your time tonight, Ezra. Thank you.